Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Armchair Cricket podcast, a podcast focusing on test cricket by armchair critics of the game. As always, we would like to thank all our listeners for supporting us by listening to our podcast and also for uh, providing uh, their feedback all along. As you know, we have been doing regular World Cup digest episodes for the past few weeks. Uh, now all that remains to be talked about is the finals that was played between England and New Zealand at Lords. this was an epic contest uh, to be remembered for ages uh, so let me invite my co-host ajit so that we can dig right into it hello ajit how is it going hi giri as you know i'm also on holiday and so are you so yeah. well it has been a long time between episodes at least with both of us talking and i think now it's time we get into the well the hard break i would call it the hard break as far as kiwis are concerned and i don't want to sound too glum because uh, england did win the world cup that's not a problem but okay before you go into the final points of the game shall we quickly take a look at the scores mm-hmm. so this was the world cup final played on the 14th of july it was held at lords in london and in this match new zealand won the toss and elected to bat first so this was a sort of a double edged sword as they say toss because it was heavily overcast and uh, putting england into bat could have been equally a good decision simply because uh, he could have backed he being kane williamson could have backed his uh, bowlers to take the wickets in the first and overs as well but he did the brave thing to put the runs on the board so they decided to bat first having done that martin guptill showed some signs of really coming to life he made a 19 runs of just 18 ball and would have quickly decimated the england bowling attack but wokes got him lbw but uh, what guptill did wrong was the ball was hitting the middle of the middle stump but he also took a review as thereby the review was lost and later it came back to bite them so henry nichols uh, made a very industrious 55 of 77 balls kept the innings going and made sure you know he built partnerships first with kane williamson who made 30 ross taylor who made 15 and whose lbw was actually very contentious but uh, ross taylor had no choice so it looked like in the end if guptill had not used up the review maybe ross taylor could have used it and maybe they would have put up a better score but we don't know these are all ifs and buts that we know about cricket right he made uh, 15 ross taylor Tom Latham kept the rest of the middle in the lower order together making a very industrious 47 again of just 56 balls. Jimmy Nijam contributed with 19. A call in the grand home did not look comfortable but he hung around to make 16 and all in all New Zealand tallied 241 for 8. So this was a very good bowling effort by the English team because um it could have been far lesser than this but given the pressure that they were under they never let New Zealand escape and build any sort of a momentum. The run rate hardly crossed 5 ever and uh, run rate final run rate of 4.82 was a bit of a credit because new zealand were always uh, high 3 uh, runs and over or just low 4 runs and over throughout their innings so they finished well all right and chris wokes took 3 for uh, 37 in his 9 overs jofra archer took 1 for 42 in 10 but he bowled much better than that his last two overs were excellent liam plunkett was a real revelation because his his place in the side could have been questioned if anybody's because somebody like moin ali could have contributed also with the bat but in the end his 3 for 42 all these wickets coming in the middle overs were very crucial mark wood took 1 for 49 but he did a good attacking job as well adil rashid took no wickets for 39 runs in 8 overs and ben stokes completed the rest of the overs when it came their turn to bat again it was sort of a sticky sort of a pitch where people who bowled in the range of 70 to 75 miles an hour could be very effective and that's what exactly happened because jason roy struggled and he was caught of henry's bowling by ladham he made just 17 johnny bersto looked to ride out the tough periods he even had a bit of fortune as well uh, by you know many of his uh, french cuts so to say um missing the stumps like stump but finally his luck ran out and he was dismissed the same way to ferguson for 36 Joe Root uh, had a very uncharacteristic innings where he made a very slow 7 of 30 balls and he was out in a very uncharacteristic fashion as well and then Owen Morgan made 9 and again he was frustrated into giving his wicket away Ben Stokes played the innings of the game without a doubt he made an unbeaten 84 of 98 balls and took England to a tie Josh Butler kept him company and these two were the real you know the engine room really came to the core the partnership that these both put together really brought England back into the game Josh Butler was going at run a ball and if Josh Butler had lasted another 5 hours the match would have been finished 
So a lot of credit here again to the New Zealand bowlers who came back into the game through Lockie Ferguson, who not only dismissed Butler, but also dismissed Wokes cheaply. And later, uh, Nisham took out Plunkett and Archer. And then a bunch of helter-skelter runouts made sure that, you know, the match was going to end in a tie. So we'll go into the final points of what happened in the last overs later, I'm sure. So if you look at the bowling of uh, New Zealand, Trent bowled was a bit unlucky, but also I think he bowled, you know, a bit brainlessly, if I may say a bit bluntly, uh, towards the end of the innings. 67 runs in 10 overs. Matt Henry was excellent, and his 1 for 40 in 10 overs really does not reflect how well he bowled. The surprise package was Colin de Grandholm, who bowls in the, at the right speed on that pitch and the right length and really stodgy sort of uh, length. And basically, he took 1 for 25 of 10 overs and really dried up the runs in the middle overs for England. Uh, Lockie Ferguson was very attacking. He took 3 for 50 of 10. Jimmy Nisham also did a very good job towards the end of the innings, and he took 3 for 43 of 7. And Santner had just three overs. That was a bit of a surprising point as well. So we'll get into all of these. Now, if you were to go back, uh, Ben Stokes was rightly awarded the man of the match and Kane Williamson was voted the player of the series. Even though there have been a couple of other players, uh, maybe they may have scored more number of runs or taken wickets along with him. For example, Shakib Alasson or Dave Warner or all of these people. I think Kane Williamson was rightly named the man of the match. It seemed like a bit of a consolation prize in the end. But his contribution, I was looking on um, Twitter, I think somebody posted this. If you look at the percentage of runs uh, Kane Williamson has scored in his team's uh, totals throughout the World Cup. He's second on a list in World Cups where Arvind De Silva had 28% of the runs scored of the entire team's totals in the World Cup. Kane Williamson is second with 25.6%. So when you see that, that gives you the idea why he's the deserved man of the tournament. Right, Giri? Absolutely. The captain that steadies the ship. And he did that on so many occasions uh, for his team. Uh, right. And I think one of... I mean, I, I don't know if uh, it's a fair reflection, uh, but I think... Uh, if you look at how he handled this defeat, or his team in general, how he how they handled this defeat, it just goes to show that uh, you know uh, New Zealand were very magnanimous, starting with the captain, and they didn't lay us you know um, any blame for that fortuitous overthrow that Ben Stokes had in the last over. For, I think England scored six runs due to that uh, overthrow, and there was I mean so many different things, and uh, the match finally being decided in favor of. England due to the number of boundaries that were, uh, you know, that that was the deciding factor between the two teams. Um, having said all that, I think Kane Williamson really stood out as a very good leader of his side um, and a thorough gentleman, thorough, thorough gentleman. And I think his whole team mm-hmm. should uh, be very proud of themselves because the way they handled the the defeat, I think it's fantastic. I don't think any team could ever do this. I think they were very good uh, on that front. But I feel very sorry for uh, his team, though. I mean, I think um, they looked very good at the uh, beginning of the tournament. They had, uh, I think, three or four successive wins. And then they kind of lost their uh, momentum towards the end of the tour, the latter part of the tournament, until they played against India in the semifinals. And suddenly, you know, they they came alive. And they seem to have done the same with uh, England, uh, uh, you know, struggling at four down for 86 when uh, Morgan was out only for Josh Butler and Ben Stokes to um, rescue them, right? So I think uh, I happened to catch this match just when Josh Butler was out. I think I just saw Butler getting out and then and I couldn't take wow. my eyes off of the television because it looked fantastic and it was shaping up to be a very close finish. And then we had close finish two times, right? Once uh, at the end of the 50 overs and then again at the end of the super over on uh, either side. And... Looking at everything, I think both teams um, basically deserve to win this match, in my opinion. And uh, Mm. Mm. deciding a World Cup title based on the number of boundaries, I think it's unfair. uh, If you take New Zealand's uh, side here, and I am going to take New Zealand's side because I think they did really well. Um, So 50-over match being decided by just one super over where, you know, whoever scores the most amount of runs in six balls. Yeah, I think that's not good. Um, Maybe it's another topic for discussion. I was just thinking about this uh, Champions Trophy match or Champions Trophy finals uh, that we had in the early 2000, I think 2002 or 2003, I can't remember when it was. And this was, I think, played even in Sri Lanka during the monsoon. And uh, the finals Mm -hmm. uh, had a reserve day. And on both days, the, uh, you know, the the planned day as well as the reserve day, it rained. And I think Sri Lanka batted first uh, and they batted two times and they couldn't finish the match. In the end, they decided that the trophy had to be shared between two different teams, uh, between two uh, India and uh, Sri Lanka. 
they should think of the same i would say i mean uh, uh, icc needs to think about this i think it's really unfair to decide the fate of the world cup on just six deliveries because it's a 47 48 matches uh, that were played in this tournament for seven weeks or so and we just decide this over you know six deliveries you know uh, on, on a similar note i think i'm also not a big fan of penalties in football you know football world cup they also use penalties mm. to decide who goes to the next stage or who wins the world cup right i i, I don't like that as well so i compare this right. to that they should do something about this i think uh, super over is not good and to be really fair at the end of it all i think they should just split this they should uh, let both teams share the world cup so i mean um <laughs> it's a bit of a rant but then again i feel really sorry for uh, new zealand and i really take their side on this occasion but well done to england i think they were the most consistent team uh, throughout the tournament and also leading up to this tournament and they showed the whole world how to uh, play in home conditions uh, and also you know in front of home crowd uh, how to pull it off um, although i have to say it's a bit uh, fortuitous towards the end well if you look if you look on this first of all gary stead the head coach of new zealand actually suggested the same thing maybe the trophy should have been tied given that there were two instances of tied uh, you know uh, co- contests on that day first during the 50 over result and then the super over result right but then the rules were set in stone before the tournament started so reconsidering it would have been unfair on england because everybody knew how it would work right but having said that there are a couple of things I could point out in which maybe New Zealand went a bit wrong. I know it, it doesn't seem right to probably point out these things because it's such a hard break, but I would actually blame Trent Bolt, who could not defend 15 of the last hour of the regulation World Cup 50-hour uh, game. Because what happened is um, he considered a six the ball before those six on the ground runs were taken right through the overthrow that was there that's one of the things the overthrow happened at the most inopportune time it has never happened like this and it happened in the final and the last over that was terrible but it happened it's still within the rules so there was a bit of a discussion whether uh, england should have gotten five runs for that you know if that was true it would have again changed the context of the game because if i runs means the strike exchanges and the tail ender gets on strike right i think it was wood he would have gotten on strike instead of uh, Ben Stokes, because the rule says that if the throw was made before the batsman crossed, the run which results from after crossing is not counted. So that meant one run was counted, then the throw came in, and then four runs were added. So five runs would have been added. So there was a small, I think a small umpiring error possibly. So this was probably not rectified in time because I remember Thermashena holding up six runs to the scorers. So this could have again changed the context of the game. This is another thing. But look, if you are a captain on the field, you are not expected to know this sort of intricacies because there are two officiating umpires. There is another officiating umpire, the third one, who could have spoken into Dharmasena's ear and asked him to hold and reconsider this. Because this could have really changed the context of this game and maybe given New Zealand the victory. Because next ball would could have been bowled by Trent Bolt and the match would have been over. Something like this. Right? This is one thing. The other thing... Look, if you look at England stuck in there, man, you have to give credit to Ben Stokes because this is a real redemption story as far as I'm concerned because after all those things that happened in Bristol a while back, he's really come back well in this World Cup. He's once or twice nearly took England home, but all of those games, he was the man to stand up and this is the game that he really stood up to be counted. He sort of redeemed himself, in my opinion, right? This is the other narrative for me. So the only other thing when it comes to that game's result Again, Trent Bolt can be blamed, if anything, for conceding 15 runs in a super over. Normally, if you look at the averages of how super overs have gone, if you ever concede more than 11 or 12 runs, the super over is usually lost. Then I would again say Jimmy Nisham did a wonderful job to even score 14 runs of five balls. And what happened in the last ball happened and only one run was able to be scored by uh, Guptill. That was very unfortunate. But look, twice they came back from the dead. Where they had a choice, they could have buried it. You know, a slightly better over by uh, Trent Bolt in either of those cases could have finished the game for them. So that's, if anything, I can find that. Otherwise, kudos for England because they kept they kept hanging in there. They never gave up. And, you know, that's that's the never say die attitude of the England team that came through. That's why they are the deserved champions for me. And that's why I would not take this trophy away for them. That's the only reason why they probably deserve to hold that trophy. Well, if you look at this game just as a game, forget that it's actually the final of a Cricket World Cup, the most pressure situation any cricketer can ever be in possibly still is this the greatest odi you've ever uh, seen or uh, you know probably witnessed i'm not sure actually i still like that 438 match between uh, right so right. africa and australia i still like that over this i have to say it still not has sunk in for me in this uh, world cup final 
but i think over a period of time i'm going to say mm. that uh, it's still that new lens match between right. uh, south africa and australia where i think that was a hell of a game we'll probably right. never have one of those for another 20 30 years yeah it was yeah. two top teams performing at the highest level unfortunately a sad day for the bowlers but uh, I, i still like that over this what about you i would give that game as the third best game of odi mm-hmm. i have ever witnessed or heard of first game is this one two ties on the same day second mm-hmm. one is the 1999 tie the clueless running tie if you know what i mean mm-hmm. the clueless yeah, with the k right mm-hmm. that second one and this is the third one because for me those two look uh, the contest at newlands where 438 was chased down was a great match but that did not end up in some momentous result for that specific team it was a bilateral series mm-hmm. the 99 world cup was a semi final which meant australia went on to win the trophy this was again a momentous game because it was the world cup final for me that's the context sets those two games above mm-hmm. the 438 and also they were ties you know mm-hmm. both those were actually decided on technicality so a game could not get any closer than that you know if you've heard all the jokes that's good doing rounds in the social media mm-hmm. uh, people are saying how do you ask england uh, how how did you win so they did not win by a number of wickets or number of runs it was Yeah, we won the World Cup. How did we win? Let's not get into that. This is one of the jokes. The other one is apparently there is a new terminology. I don't know if you have heard it. You have been New Zealanded. So when two people have the same number of score or same number of marks, if one finishes above the other, then you have been New Zealanded apparently. Mm-hmm. So this is the other new terminology that has taken birth after this World Cup, the phenomenon that we witnessed on 14th, mm-hmm. right? So look, you are absolutely right. I am still reliving it in my head. i can yeah as you say i can still feel i can see martin gapil steers i can see the run out happening it's still right in front of my self probably continue to do that for a week but all in all it was a very very unfair thing that new zealand had to undergo and if anything the magnanimity was even more even more painful because if williamson had come out to the press conference and ranted a little that would have shown uh, shown uh, the rest of us who are less human than him that he's also human Uh, it's not right that somebody so good so exemplary a human being actually deserves to lose the final it's unfortunate mm-hmm. it happened right yeah even federer has shown his emotions right even oh, federer yes. Yes. yes 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 and unfortunately you know i'm also a federer fan and he lost also on the same day not a happy day oh, it's the same for me and i think but that was probably the greatest sporting day for me in the last decade i wouldn't go any further beyond that because i'll have to look uh, back at much of the other sporting days i've witnessed where multiple things have happened at the same day but this mm-hmm. might be the best sporting day in the last decade for me personally right how about you uh, i kind of agree with you i kind of agree with you on that because yeah i can't think of anything better uh, wimbledon i think that was one of the longest finals uh, hard fought finals and federer had a match point he could have won it but he still lost it right so he was so near yet so far and the same with new zealand so ah it's a, yeah i think it's it, it's a day to remember even though the team or the person who should have won you know could have won it but did not uh, but i think it was a great contest between two uh, adversaries wonderful indeed indeed well uh, we have to reluctantly move on a little to see if mm. we can look at some of the other things some of the things that are coming out of the world cup so to say uh, let's first look at the uh, news that is surrounding the indian team right so first of all is it true there may be a rift in the indian dressing room between rohit sharma and virat uh, giri i don't read too much into that to be honest uh, because what i read there was uh, the indian team were supposed to travel on sunday together but rohit sharma left couple of days earlier with his family with his wife and his uh, little daughter if i'm not wrong i think he left on friday and some media outlets have been suggesting that there was a kind of a disagreement over what happened in the semi finals against uh, new zealand especially over the number 4 position especially over uh, uh, dhoni's batting position uh, right. but this is all you know speculation in my opinion because i have not heard either kohli or rohit sharma make a statement make an official statement and neither has ravi shastri spoken about this yeah i mean it's it's it may be just pure conjecture i i can't say anything further than that hmm. a couple of small things well i think rohit sharma indeed flew ahead of uh, the rest of the team and once the world cup is done well it's his time i guess and he wants to spend more time with his family that's what i would conclude you're right we probably shouldn't be reading too much into it except there are a couple of interesting developments around the sidelines one a functionary in air courts of bcci was contacted about it who wanted to remain nameless of course and he said that 
indeed bcci is actually considering a split captaincy this is not something official from bcci and look bcci will not put out these things lightly so if it if ever such a news will come it will come with a decision saying we have decided to split captaincy mr a will captain this formats mr b will captain those formats rohit and virat in this case mm-hmm. but we'll, we i would say we'll just have to wait and watch because look for me tactically rohit is a better skipper than virat virat is the more emotional more driven of the two without a doubt but as a skipper in shorter formats of the game probably rohit outranks virat virat is no doubt the best batsman of the team and probably except for virat rohit is the next best of course right so for me maybe splitting the captaincy is not such a bad thing this is a personal opinion uh, do you think that could still work that way i have spoken about this in one of our early episodes i think this is the right way forward if this is indeed the case you know if bcci does take it up uh, rohit sharma should be made immediately uh, the captain of odi and t20 side and virat kohli should continue to be the test captain because i think rohit has already won a few trophies you know for example uh, mumbai indians right he's been winning a lot of trophies for them in ipl and how many has uh, virat kohli won for rcb good question not a lot so i mean rohit sharma is probably a good uh, people uh, manager i think he knows how to um, get things done from his uh, side at the same time he is less emotional on the field he is not uh, uh, as animated as kohli is maybe it's good in the long run maybe kohli also needs a break uh, so that he can focus more on his batting and bring his a game you know playing at number 3 like jorut is doing for uh, england so why not i i i really like this uh, option of having rohit uh, captaining the odi and t20 side well i mean let's see well, let's follow the space and these uh, news stories a bit carefully and uh, we'll see what comes out in the upcoming days and weeks right so the next big question the elephant in the room Mm-hmm. Mr Mahendra Singh Dhoni should he mm-hmm. stick or twist should he stay should he retire should he tour west indies or should he call it quits what what what's your thoughts kiri well i spoke about this already uh, i think in the match preceding the one i think it was the india england match in the world cup i already spoke about this back then of uh, dhoni's lack of intent right i am a huge fan of dhoni i know he is a born winner he won it for india in 2011 but i think his uh, time has come he has to uh, uh, he has to hang up his boots and then uh, say goodbye to the sport he dearly you know loves and we all we are we are all a huge fan of dhoni he has won it like i said mm. but i think it's probably time for him now to call it a day and i think he will end his career on a high because he took india to semi finals yet again nobody will look at uh, his lack of intent or uh, his failure to rotate strike or you know is not him not being able to hit as fluently as he did you know once upon a time nobody will remember all that they will just look at his scores and then they will see that uh, the team which played um, along with him went to semi finals and they lost against a very good uh, new zealand side so so i mean i don't know what bccci will do will they give him an option to choose his exit date or will they still say hey he has a lot of life left in him so let's continue with uh, dhoni for some more time and let guys like uh, rishabh pant uh, lay along on the sidelines and uh, not be given enough match time it's time to look over i think he, he, they have to turn a page and then uh, look uh, towards the future here but let's see what happens what what do you what do you think about this should he go i think his time has come as big a fan as i am as well there is a diminishing uh, you know returns on his uh, skills that he has for sure and the way he's uh, able to convert them at least with the bat look his mentorship on the field what you were mentioning to me off air right his mentorship in the field the way he speaks to the spinners while they're bowling all of these are are the best it's his time has come and i think it's time he made way and usually dhoni is the sort of uh, cricketer as well as a leader we see he's always Uh, he's always uh, known this when his time has come and he's usually jumped well before anybody pushes him i would say i think because it's such a momentous decision he would probably just uh, not make anything right away if anything he could have even conveyed something to the selectors and requested them to not make anything public for example what remains to be seen is at the timing of the announcement but all i would think is it's time for him to go and knowing him he would probably already retire before he's ever asked by anybody and look he can always go out on a high he scored a 15 the last match he tried his best no matter what you know the situation he was still there till the very end almost and it was okay and uh, it's unfortunate that such a glorious career has to come to an end but this happens to everybody and his time has come this is my thought right 
Now, if you were to go further, Alex Carey, uh, the Australian keeper, did a wonderful job with the bat right through the World Cup. Whenever he was needed, whenever he was called upon, he played multiple roles, even mm-hmm. in the semi-final as well. So, mm-hmm. I think he's impressed the selectors enough that you know they are actually considering him as one of the backup batters in the Ashes squad. So that means you know he's again competing with the likes of Wade, Peter Hanscom, all of these people who would probably. You know, out of four uh, people or five people, two people would find a slot there. And it looks like Glenn Maxwell and Steinis have not done enough to justify their position in the, or justify a chance in the test team. So it looks like, you know, Carey may actually come a bit ahead in the taxi rank or taxi cab rank, as they say. Let's see how that goes. All right. If you were to take a quick look at some of the scores or some of the news from outside of the World Cup, right? So Ireland and Zimbabwe played the second T20I. And Zimbabwe won this game comfortably. So they made sure that the series was tied 1-1. So this game was again played in Brady Cricket Club in Ireland. And this one was won by Zimbabwe by eight wickets. This was a full game. That is a 20-over game. And Ireland made 171 for nine. So it was a very competitive score. Gary Wilson, the captain, made 47. And then uh, Thompson made 32. Mark Adair made 38. Right. So overall, that was a reasonably good uh, score. But Zimbabwe, I think, finally woke up. And they decided to take this game. And Brendan Taylor opened and made 39. Even though the skipper, Mazakadza, who's had a terrible time failed making a duck, Craig Irwin made an unbeaten 68 and Sean Williams made an unbeaten 58 and they finished the game off. So as a result, uh, the series was tied one all. And at least Zimbabwe take one game that they won away from the Tour of Ireland. So it's, it's not a complete write-off for them. So at least they can be proud of that. right? In the other important news, let's say with the Ashes coming up, so the concussion substitutes discussion is currently being held by ICC. And if the ICC uh, committee that's currently meeting in London agrees to this proposal, concussion substitutes would be tried out in the Ashes Test Series. Giri, do you think it's a good idea? I think it's a very good idea. But uh, how is a concussion diagnosed? Is it done by a professional or a doctor before a substitute is called upon? What are the criteria here? Do you know that? Okay. Yes. So... Uh, first of all, the concussion rules have changed in as much the concussion call is taken by the physio of the team. Mm-hmm. So okay. if team bats or batter is it, if I'm the physio of the team, I get to go there, I get to take the first call. So uh, the batter can continue or not is actually my decision, no longer the batsman's decision, technically. At least I think okay. one of the Afghanistan batsmen may have flaunted that. But outside of that, the batter will continue only if the concussion is not detected by the, let's say, the physio of the team. Once he comes off field, he's immediately referred to another let's say, uh, opinion. This could be the physio of the other team. It could be a professional doctor. And within a matter of a few hours, they determine. And it's basically out of the player's hands. And the fields, mm-hmm. uh, the physios and the uh, doctors off-field decide it. And if they recommend that he's uh, eligible for a substitution, only then a substitution is made. Okay. I think that's a very good point. Eligibility for substitution is uh, very key here. Because this could, I don't know, I mean, it could potentially be used... Uh, strategically i don't want right. it to be being uh, abused <laughs> nah, so it's good nah. it, it's important that they have a third party or uh, an unbiased uh, opinion here uh, when they take a call on the, uh, whether the substitute should be allowed or not so that's that's a good point i think it but it's a it's a step in the right direction i think we spoke about this in one of our earlier episodes when yeah. aaron finch already spoke about this right he mm-hmm. advocated this Yes. Um, and if ICC implement this, they have to do it with a bit of caution. But I think I'm sure they will have all the bases covered. Yeah. Well, I mean, this basically means there has to be an independent medical professional also present in every yeah. international cricket match. But yeah, yeah that, that's arrangeable. I think that's doable, right? Mm-hmm. If there will be enough people in the crowd, I, I'm sure. But okay. I'm being fastidious, mm-hmm. but I think you understand it. All right. So um, now the next thing we can look at is the trivia section. So from the previous episode, it was a slightly tricky one. So it was for the niche cricket fans that follow us. So the question was, which ODI match holds the record for the most wickets taken by left-arm seamers? So it's very specific, right? So uh, no surprise there, Yogesh has got the answer right. This was basically the match number 43 of the ongoing World Cup or the just concluded World Cup between Pakistan and Bangladesh, where 13 wickets were taken. So there were two 5-4s. Shaheen Shafridi took a 5-4 and Mustafizur Rahman took a 5-4. And outside of that, Wahab Riyaz also took some wickets. So there were 13 wickets taken. This was actually pointed out by Andy Zaltzman in the Unbelievable Ashes podcast, one of his latest episodes. And we got the idea from there. First of all, congrats to Yogesh. And I hope, you know, some of our other listeners were also, you know, niche and were into really chats and those things are able to guess these sort of questions right. Now, uh, the trivia question for this episode is, 
which was the first ever match to have a super over result so you know we've spoken a lot about super overs in this episode and what not so it makes sense that we actually also make our question around it so which was the first ever match to have a super over result so i hope you paid attention to what i have actually left out there all right you could send us the answer to this question through social media platforms for example on twitter at @amchekrickpod through the facebook page or you could write into us at amche.cricket@gmail.com you could always write into us with your thoughts and your you know suggestions this always encourages also the more number of answers to the questions be they right or wrong they also encourage us that means we are able to reach a bigger audience that's really nice well the world cup may have ended but we know that the england versus ireland test is going to start next week already we we also have a few guests lined up so we are also probably going to have some interesting discussions about how the world cup final ended and so on so i hope you guys are tuned in and you you know listen to our upcoming episodes as well having said all that it's a goodbye from me and it's a goodbye from him bye bye you're listening to the armchair cricket podcast